All right, so you've managed to write some assembly. Maybe you've even gotten some shellcode running inside of some of the Poem College challenges. In this video, I'm going to take a look at various techniques you can use to both build your shellcode and debug it to hopefully show you a better way to develop shellcode uh, than what you're currently doing. Uh, we're going to start from kind of the simplest techniques and then move to kind of more advanced ones. And hopefully along the way, uh, you find something that you didn't know you could do. So the kind of first thing that's worth talking about is just the most basic thing that we could possibly do. And that is by calling all of the commands necessary to go from an assembly file to shellcode that we could pass into uh, a binary, have working shellcode. Uh, so over here on the right hand side, uh, I'm going to edit a file. We're going to call it shellcode.s. Uh, we're going to start with some kind of generic boilerplate here. We're going to say Intel syntax, no prefix. We're going to say global, not global, global, underscore start. Uh, we're then going to have our start label. It's going to be a very simple binary uh, that we're going to build or simple shell code. What we're going to do is we're going to call uh, exits. We're going to say move RAX 60. See if I can type. Uh, move RAX 60. We're going to move RDI 1337. And then we're going to perform a syscall. Uh, in case you're unaware, uh, 60 is the syscall number for performing an exit syscall. Uh, the syscall number goes in RAX. RDI is the register for the first argument uh, to a syscall. And then the syscall happens by executing the syscall instruction. Uh, so these three instructions will execute syscall with the first argument being 1337, uh, which should call exit uh, and show us uh, 1337 on the exit code, uh, or at least an interpretation of 1337. Uh, so now that we have that, we've uh, written shellcode.s, uh, we're going to assemble it into an object file. And we do that with as. Uh, we're going to specify our output is going to be shellcode.o. .o is just a convention. We could really call it whatever we want. And the file that we are using as input is shellcode.s. If we take a look at shellcode.o, uh, what we see here is this is an L file, but it doesn't say it's executable. And if we take a look at the permissions of shellcode.o, uh, it doesn't have the executable bit set. Now, one thing you might think at face value is, all right, well, let's just make this thing executable, right? I'm smarter than the computer. Uh, and if we do that, uh, yeah, this has the executable bit, executable bit set, but when we try and execute it, we get an error. And that's because this isn't an executable elf, right? We tried to execute it, uh, but it doesn't um, have the executable format. It's not an executable elf. And so we don't actually get anything done. Now we can make it an executable elf by linking it. Uh, we do that with the LD command. So we can say that LD dash O, uh, we're gonna call it shellcode dash elf. That is what our output's gonna be. And what we want to link is shellcode dot O. We take a quick look here at what is shellcode dash elf. Uh, this is in fact an elf file, but now it is an executable elf file. Uh, what this means is that I can run it. Well, that is a pretty exciting uh, executable file, right? All it does is call exit, but how do we know that it's actually calling exit with uh, 1337, right? How do I debug the assembly and make sure this is doing what I think right now at this stage, if this is how I'm going to try and build my shell code? Uh, well, what I would probably want to do is I'd run, want to run strace. strace is a command that shows us the syscalls that are executed inside of the program that we specify. And so if I run strace on shellcode-elf, uh, what we see here is shellcode-elf is executed. It then calls exit with 1337 and the program exits. Not very exciting, but it is doing what I think it should be doing. Well, I still haven't made shellcode. What I've done is I've gone from uh, my assembly file to an object file to an elf that's executable. I still haven't actually made shellcode. To make shellcode, I need to pull out the text section from this elf because an elf contains a whole lot more um, than just the executable instructions that we care about. 
So this shellcode elf is 4,696 bytes. Uh, I guarantee you most of that is not these three assembly instructions. If I want to just pull out those assembly instructions, uh, what I can do is I can use object copy. We can say object copy, dump section. The section I'm interested in is the text section. Uh, that's where the executable instructions are located. I want to copy the text section into a file, uh, which we will call shellcode. And we're going to pull the text section out of shellcode elf. Now, if we take a look at shellcode, it thinks it's zlib compressed data. Uh, it turns out that these are just raw bytes. And so the file command isn't going to be able to know what the heck this thing is, right? So how do I take a look at my shellcode? Well, I could try and open it up in like Vim, but this looks like a whole bunch of, that's a giant mess that doesn't mean anything to me. If I want to try and understand the bytes that are in my shellcode, I need to use something like OD, and this shows me uh, the values of my shellcode, but that is also not a very useful format. I probably want to look at this in hexadecimal. And so we could use something like hex dump. And now this is a sane interpretation of the bytes that are my shellcode. And we see here that my shellcode, this is 16, because um, this is a hexadecimal counting from here to here. We can confirm that by looking at shellcode. Uh, with ls, we see our shellcode is actually 16 bytes, and these are those 16 bytes, or at least the hexadecimal representation. And so these 16 uh, machine code bytes correspond to these three assembly instructions. But we saw that that took many commands. And so if I, for instance, didn't want to have null bytes in, in my shellcode, well, I see that there are null bytes here. So maybe I need to go over here and change some instructions. But then for me to get back to checking this, I have to run AS again, I have to run LD again, I have to run uh, object copy again, and then I have to run hex dump again. That's a whole lot of commands I need to execute to get information from what I'm working on to what I care about. You can certainly do that, uh, but it would be a pretty inefficient workflow. So we can go one step improved. Uh, and we can call GCC directly. GCC is commonly referred to as the compiler. It's actually a collection of compiler tools. And so if we call GCC uh, with these arguments here, it is functionally going to be the same thing as if I called AS and LD. We can just do it in one go. Uh, so let's remove our shellcode elf and let's try and create shellcode elf using GCC. Uh, so we'll say GCC, uh, no standard lib, static. My output is going to be shellcode elf. My input is shellcode s. Take a look again. Shellcode elf is an executable elf. Uh, we can run it. If we s trace it, it behaves as expected. It's calling exit 1337. Uh, I can call that same object copy command to pull the shellcode out, and we would end up with pretty much the exact same thing. Now that is still a whole lot of work, right? Because we're doing all of this at the command line level, we're running all of these commands. You could write a shell script uh, to automate some of it, but it's still not a very quick workflow. Uh, what I would encourage people to do is starting at like this third option here, uh, and that is use Python and Pwn tools to do a lot of the heavy lifting for you. Uh, just like how GCC uh, can call AS and LD under the hood, uh, by using Python and Pwn tools, uh, this will call GCC or AS and LD under the hood for you. Uh, but instead we're working with it at a higher abstraction level because we, we have kind of the convenience of Python. The vast majority of material from this point forward, uh, exploits are, the easiest way to write exploits uh, is going to be to use Python and to use Pwn tools to do a lot of the heavy lifting for you. Uh, and we see kind of an example here of how I can uh, assemble something and get these shellcode bytes in Python. Uh, let's take a quick look at what that looks like here. So I'm going to use IPython3, which is an interactive Python interpreter. If you want to, and honestly, I would probably encourage you uh, to instead uh, write some type of Python file uh, and then iterate it in a file. That way you don't lose your work. 
But anything that I do up here in the interpreter, you can type the exact same thing in a file. Uh, the benefit of it being a file is that it is consistent and persistent. So in the event something in, you know crazy insane happens, you still have your script be like, this is what I did. And you can show that uh, and, and use that as a template for the next challenge. So uh, we're going to start off here with from Pwn, import star. Uh, the next thing I need to do is I need to specify the architecture that we're working with. And we do that with context.arch equals AMD64. This is some boilerplate that you will see me type probably a thousand times over the course uh, of this uh, material. If you do not specify this architecture, Pwn Tools will assume that you are working on uh, I386 or the 32-bit version uh, of um, this, this instruction set. And that means you'll get a bunch of errors as soon as you try and reference the 64-bit register because 64-bit registers don't exist in a 32-bit architecture. Now, the first part that is kind of interesting is we can uh, create a variable. I'm just going to call it my shell code. Uh, and we can call this ASM function that Pwn Tools provides. Uh, and in here, we can write the exact same stuff that we're doing on the right-hand side with our shellcode.s file, except now I don't have to have that kind of boilerplate. I don't have to have Intel syntax. I don't have to say global start. I can just immediately start writing assembly. So let's take that same assembly over here. We have move RAX60. Uh, we have move RDI1337. Uh, we have syscall. And I'm going to print out my shellcode. Uh, what's happened here is I now have, uh, let's see how long my shellcode is. Uh, length of my shellcode, boom. Uh, I still have a 16-byte shellcode, but now I'm able to, as you just saw, quickly change the Python code that I am working with, run it, and get information and iterate on what I'm working on. Now, if we just print my shellcode here, this isn't very pretty or useful, right? I Hypothetically, I'm trying to get rid of like null bytes. Well, there's null bytes here, there's null bytes here, but I don't know what instruction is is related to which bytes, right? Well, Pwn Tools can help us out here. Uh, they expose a function called uh, DISASM, shorthand, or it's a shorthand for disassemble, right? Uh, I want to go from the machine code bytes back up to some human understandable assembly. And now I get a nice printout that shows me these bytes are this instruction, these bytes are this instruction. And so if I was trying to eliminate something, like I think shell coding level four says have no H bytes. This will be a little bit of a detour, but uh, an H byte, and why we call it an H byte, uh, is this 48. And I happen to know that it's 48, uh, but if you did not, uh, you can look at an ASCII table, and if we search for the letter H here, uh, we see the character capital H has a hexadecimal value of 48. So, uh, this 48 is an H byte. Now, we didn't just choose the letter H because we don't like the letter H, all right? Uh, we chose it for a reason, and that's because in AMD64, uh, machine code bytes, 48, hex 48 is used as a prefix for a lot of instructions that reference 64-bit registers. So that means if you are doing something on, for instance, RAX, RDI, any of the registers that begin with R, right, those would be 64-bit registers, there's a decent chance that that instruction starts with 48. Uh, this was kind of a design or implementation decision uh, in how AMD64 uh, was kind of built. And so if I wanted to get rid of these 40, these 48, these H bytes, uh, what I could do right here, well, I don't really need to move 60 into RAX, right? I can move 60 into EAX and moving a value into a 32-bit register will zero out the higher order um, bits, the higher 32 bits. So this functionally does the exact same thing. I could do the same thing here with RDI, just change that to EDI. If we do that, we print our disassembly. I've done the same thing, 
but now I don't have this hex 48. And so that that's 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 pretty handy because now I can start writing my shell code. Let's I don't know for whatever reason. Let's push R A X. Okay, and we see what we see here is as I change it, I can go here. Oh, I can't push a 32-bit register. So I, I, I typed something and all of a sudden Pwn Tools and Python blew up and it gave me this giant error, right? You'll notice that I was doing like one change, running it, making sure that it worked, right? Uh, you do get to see the error message that happened. It's hiding in this giant mess of, of error. Uh, the error was the operand, uh, which is EAX, was not the correct type for a push instruction. I can't push a 32 um, bit register to the stack. Uh, what I can do is I can push a 64 bit register. Uh, what I can do is I can push uh, a word. So that's two bytes. Uh, for instance, if what happens if I just want to push uh, the letter A or hex six one. Okay, well I can push six one and we see that there's one byte for the push, and then there is the value that I'm going to be pushing there. And so we can start to make sense about, well, what bytes correspond to what part of his, of the assembly that I'm writing. And this gives me a pretty fast loop to work on that. Now, what if instead of just looking at bytes, I want to do a bit more, right? Uh, maybe, Maybe I want to try and use some advanced functionality. Well, Pwn Tools has something, something for that as well. Uh, Pwn Tools has a kind of library of existing shell code and something that's called shell craft. And we, we can expose that. So if we look at what I have here, I had my shell code equals ASM. And then we printed that. Uh, let's take a little detour here. And I'm going to say I want to print shell craft uh what do i what do i have here okay i say cat flag that works um shell craft cat flag so when i call shell craft cat flag it's going to return a kind of predefined set of instructions of assembly instructions that will perform the action of catting the flag now we see that they're they're doing some like obfuscation techniques here. Uh, we're XORing some values here to try and hide this string. You know, maybe I don't need to do all of that, but it gives me some boilerplate that I could work with or something I could look at to start from. And I can combine this with what we've already seen. I could say, I want to look at the disassembly of the assembly of this uh, set of assembly instructions. And if I can type what we'll see here, boom, I now have a predefined kind of framework to start thinking about. I can see where the, my problem bytes are, right? Uh, here's if, uh, an H byte, here's an H byte, here's an H byte, uh, here's, a, here's an H byte. So I, I kind of know where my problem instructions are for what I'm trying to do. Just saying, you could use this as a launching off point. Now, in my personal opinion, uh, as the slide says here, you should be pretty cautious about over relying on magic tools. Shellcraft is a magic tool, right? Uh, because I just type shellcraft cat flag and it just, here you go. If you don't understand what's going on, uh, as far as these assembly instructions, that will come back to bite you. Uh, but it is something that is just another tool in your tool belt uh, to use uh, when you're trying to kind of tackle these type of problems. Now, another thing that you may want to do is just debug your shell code. Now, we saw that I could use strace on my shellcode elf to try and understand if my syscalls are working correctly. Well, you can do the same thing here uh, with the challenge binaries. So hopefully I still have my 
uh, shell code. I have my 16 bytes of shell code that call exit. Uh, what I can do here is I could cat that shell code into, uh, for instance, baby shell level four. Okay, and it says that I failed. Well, that's a, that's a bit of a bummer. Okay. I'm going to cheat here. I'm going to... What am I going to do? Okay. Well, I need to have some shell code that I need to cat into this file to do this, to do this demo. Let's use Python to do it. So I have my shell code, right? And this is just that simple, let's call exit. Well, these are my shell code bytes in my shell code. I can say with open shell code two, I want to write as a, uh, in a binary format to this file named shell code two. And what do I want to write? Or with uh, open as F. I'm going to say F write my shell code. If we run that. All right, nothing exciting happened, but now I have shell code two. I solved my problem pretty quickly by using Python. So now let's do kind of the equivalent of what this slide says here. Cat my shell code into the target. And this shouldn't have any H bytes, uh, as we saw earlier. So we cat shell code two into our challenge. All right, our challenge says that it's executing the shell code. How do I know that everything is behaving how I expect inside of the challenge? Well, we can use S trace again. Uh, we cat our shell code into S trace of the challenge. Well, there's a lot more going on than before, uh, but we do see at do see here at the end executing shell code, and we see that the exit sys call was performed as I expected. Now, one of the problems that you can run into uh, when you use S trace like this, uh, or just like any debugging tool, so S trace, GDB, um, etc., is uh, the challenge binaries are set UID. It's why we have this S. So when we run them normally, we just run them here on the command line, uh, they run as root. Uh, we see this right here is our challenge binary. It doesn't show it because we're clever like that. Uh, but this is the process of our challenge binary. And we see that the user that it's running as is root. That is what allows it to have access to read the flag or open the flag file. If I S trace challenge baby shell four, right now the challenge is hanging out. Uh, we see it's calling read, but it hasn't finished. It's waiting for input. Let's take another look. Here is that challenge process, but now it's running as the hacker user. So if I am running S trace, and I wrote shell code that's going to open the flag file, even if my shell code is correct, it's going to fail. And it's going to fail every time because I'm using S trace on this challenge binary, which will drop our permissions. Now, you'll notice that I started this challenge in practice mode, and you should start every challenge in practice mode, especially if you're not, if you just, if you are unsure, you're not like, I instantly know how to solve this, start it in practice mode. And the reason is, so I said S trace drops permissions. Well, what if I pseudo S trace and run the challenge? All right, we're at that same spot. Now we see the challenge is running as the root user, but I'm still getting my S trace output. When you're in practice mode, you can use sudo. You can even sudo su, and now I'm just root on this box, right? I, I can just cat the flag. It's always going to say Pwn College Practice, which is a useless flag, uh, but we can use this mode to avoid some of those debugging pitfalls. So now I can use debugging tools and still allow the challenge to run with elevated permissions. So S trace is one tool that you can use. 
Uh, now, strace will drop permissions, as I just showed. For best results, run the strace as the root user when you're debugging. This is a gotcha that happens constantly. Now, we can debug our assembly right, uh, directly inside of GDB, uh, leveraging Pwn tools. So this S trace, when I'm passing my shellcode into it, is great if everything I'm doing is just a system call. What if I care about the individual instructions and I'm trying to figure out like what's going on in memory? S trace isn't the tool that's going to help me. So if we go back here to our kind of Python setup, we're going to clear out some of this, this boilerplate that we had. Uh, but I still have my assembly instructions. Uh, another functionality that Pwn Tools exposes uh, is GDB debug assembly. And if we run this, now you'll note that I'm inside of a TMUX session, which is why we're going to see this split off into a second window. Uh, what has happened here is Pwn Tools performed all of the work to turn our assembly into shellcode. It's launched it, and it's launched a GDB session that starts at the beginning of my shellcode. And so now I can step through my sh the instructions of my shellcode inside of my debugger. And if there was something wrong, no big deal. I'm back here in Python. Uh, maybe I needed uh, to add to EDX 12. Cool. And now we can do this. And now I'm immediately just working on my shell code. And so this gives me a quick feedback loop if I want to see uh, what my shell code instructions are doing in a debugger. Now, what if uh, you're using this, this Python workflow, but you wanted to use strace? You'd be like, hey, man, like you're showing all this cool stuff, but I liked strace. That was pretty quick. Well, it turns out uh, you can interact with challenges programmatically, right? It's great that we can build this, uh, this shell code here in Python, but we can, we can do the whole, the whole shebang. So let's have my shell code uh, equals ASM uh, of this. Well, now I'm going to try and programmatically interact with a process. And the process I want to work with is challenge baby. Is that what it's called? Let's find out. Yeah, baby shell level four. Baby shell level four. And then I want to send my shell code into the challenge. And this is just a good habit. Always end these type of process interaction things with P Interactive uh, until you understand why I'm saying that. Now, if I run this right here, what's my Python code going to do? Well, it's going to assemble uh, and pull out all of the shell code from these instructions. It's going to start up this challenge process. It's going to pass it the shell code bytes. And then it is going to be interactive, which means standard in is going to tie to the terminal and standard out of the challenge process will be what I see. And if we run this, uh, we see, okay, cool. We are able to run this and pass these assembly instructions to the challenge, but now we're doing it from Python. Okay, that's a step in the right direction. What if I wanted to do uh, strace on this? That's okay. It turns out, You can specify multiple arguments to the process that you're trying to run here. So if I want to work on my shell code here in Python and then S trace the challenge as the challenge gets the shell code that I'm working on in my script, we can do that just like this. Let's run it. Okay, cool. Now, one thing to be aware of is something I already said. I'm running the process using Pwn tools, we're running it under strace. Here's my process. It is now running as the hacker user. Because remember, 
S trace will drop permissions. And that's what we're doing right here. I'm running Python as the hacker user. I'm running S trace as the hacker user. The challenge is now going to run as the hacker user. If I want to fix that, we can call sudo S trace challenge inside of our Python script. Here we should be able to, let's find out. Now, here is my challenge process. It is running as the root user. We're S tracing it. And we're doing it all from Python. Now I'm S tracing it with that generated assembly that I have inside of my Python script. Now, one other thing that you may be trying to do is you're trying to run GDB on these challenges. I want to step through my shell code inside of the challenges. I'm probably getting ahead of myself. Let's let's fall back to the slides here. Okay, uh, so it says that we can debug our shell code inside of the challenge itself. I, I was I was right there. Uh, so we're going to debug the shell code inside of the challenge itself, and we're going to use Python to do it. Uh, the way that we can do that is we're going to change our process back to having just one argument because the thing that I want to debug is the challenge. I don't want to debug sudo. I don't want to debug strace. And so we have this kind of familiar pattern, but I'm going to change process to GDB debug. If I run this, I get that GDB window popping up. Again, it's because I am inside of a TMUX session that it's splitting like this. Uh, you can do the same thing inside of the Dojo's desktop interface. It'll pop up a terminal window. And so now I am inside we have a main. Cool. Let's run the main. Let's disassemble main. Uh, main is going to call my shell code. Uh, looking at this, I'm going to say it is right here. Uh, so I'm going to break at main plus 743 because I see this is a, a strange instruction. We're calling a, a register. Now that's why I'm interested in that spot right there. I'm going to continue forward. So now we are at call RDX. I'm going to step into this call. This looks pretty familiar. You know what this is? These are those same instructions. So if I step through here, so I'm stepping past move hex 3C EAX or EAX. Let's print EAX. Okay, well, yeah, I saw it was hex 3, but let's print it as a decimal number. That's 60. This is my shell code now inside the challenge being executed that I am debugging. Right here, this is where I'm going to call exit. As we step through, we uh, see that the process exited. In this case, it's uh, with exit code 71, but that's because that's how uh, 1337 is being interpreted by the exit syscall. Uh, we quit out a GDB. I'm right back to my Python to work on it and fix whatever it is I learned in my debugging session. It's a very effective way to write your shell code, test it, see what's going on, fix your shell code, right? We're getting right to, I'm writing my shell code, I'm looking at it and seeing what's happening. Now, one of the other things that I mentioned here is that you can use the int3 instruction uh, if you are using GDB. It's kind of like a cheat code for debugging shell code. If we throw an int3 at the beginning of my shell code, and we saw I was setting this breakpoint at like this arbitrary magic spot. Like, I, I don't want to deal with that, right? I, I That's fine. GDB is going to pause at start, well, which is kind of the, the beginning of execution, the beginning of time here. Uh, and I'm not, I'm go, we're not going to set any breakpoints. If we look here on info break, there are no breakpoints. I'm just going to continue. We still end up breaking. And we break at the beginning of my shell code. That's because uh, we see that the reason that GDB stopped is because it got a sig trap. That sig trap is what happens 
when this int3 instruction is executed. So now I don't even have to worry about setting breakpoints. I have this process going on right here, or this uh, program, this script, this Python script going with Pwn tools, where I can edit and work on my assembly. And then immediately get to a debugger at exactly the point that I'm interested in. And that is insanely powerful. Now, you may want to check, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, does my shellcode have bad bytes? And we, we saw uh, that I could print out uh, my shellcode. Right? We could print this thing. Well, this is just a byte stream, as we saw, which means we can programmatically interact with it. Uh, we can say if the letter H, the byte that is the capital letter H, is in my shellcode, uh, then print uh, bad byte found. Right? We're essentially doing the same thing uh, here. OK, there's no bad bytes. I have to be writing. We're getting good shellcode at the moment. What happens if I do something like this? Well, if what I'm working on uh, has a, an H byte in it, it just says bad byte found and it prints it out to me. And let's print it out the pretty way. Oh, what did I what did I miss? All right. So this had an H byte in it, in which case my script is going to say bad byte found and then it's going to pretty print the bytes and the instructions so I can look at it and be like, oh, there's my bad byte. It's right there. It's in this move RAX. I can go up to my script. I can change this instruction from RAX to EAX, I can run this script again. Well, now there's no bad byte found. And so what happens is we're gonna drop into GDB. We can continue. I had that in three at the beginning. I'm immediately in the debugger so that I can step through my shell code that passed that check, right? I satisfied that constraint. Now I said strace drops permissions. Well, it turns out so does GDB. This one is a bit of a gotcha. So I've been doing all of this as the hacker user. If you are writing, and this is one of those benefits of writing a Python file over using the interpreter, uh, because I would have something, uh, something like my Python script, right? My Python or my script.py. And I'd be running it uh, like this, Python 3, my script.py. Well, if my script is calling that GDB debug, then it's all running as the hacker user, GDB is the hacker user, the challenge is the hacker user. We're going to inevitably at some point run into permission problems. We can address that uh, by running my Python file as root. It's sudo Python 3 and then your script file. And now I could run GDB have the program execute with all of the permissions, no problems, and quickly iterate and loop through what I'm working on, right? I can quickly go and find the answer to what it is that is the problem. And this is what I would strongly encourage people try and work up toward. I understand that you may not be a GDB pro, and so you get to this point right here, and you're not entirely sure what it is that you need to do or what it is you need to look at. That, that'll take a little bit of time. But these are the right tools to use to reason about what is going on inside of these programs. And we're going to continue in almost every other module and topic that we discuss to use Pwn tools, to use JDB, to use strace. And we're going to just add more and more functionality to uh, these scripts. This, this is going to be kind of where we spend a lot of our time. 
Uh, so I would strongly encourage people to start trying to move toward this type of workflow now because it will pay massive dividends uh, as we progress through the course.